I'm Juan Mandujano Sanchez. I'm a last year ortho resident, and it's an honor to me to translate to one of my professors, Dr. Jose Maria Jimenez Avila. Good morning, I'm Dr. Jose Maria Jimenez Avila. I have my practice in Guadalajara, Mexico. I'm in charge of the spine clinic at the Centro Médico Nacional de Occidente, IMSS, and I'm the regional director of social service in medicine at Tec de Monterrey on the Guadalajara campus. During these sessions, we are going to share some concepts related to the management of traumatic thoracolumbar fractures. I have nothing to declare. And this is part of the academic activities that we have been doing recently. Among the objectives we will talk about today are to describe the classifications of thoracolumbar fractures, the biomechanical principles in the treatment of these fractures, to describe the treatment options in the types of fractures and to identify the criteria that help decide if we opt for a non-surgical or surgical approach. We know that the treatment of these fractures is challenging. Potential complications can lead the patient to a miserable fate, generating pain and progressive deformity if the evaluation process and early systematic and comprehensive management are not carried out appropriately. This type of fractures has been the great interest through history, as we can see in different old engravings, where one of the fundamental objectives is to improve stabilization, reduce and decompress the spine. The most important thing is that the decisions we are going to make are decisions made based on our capabilities, our knowledge and obtained through springs and what we evidence tell us, always based on ethical concepts and also taking into account patient expectations. As far as incidents, we know that these type of fractures occur more frequently between the T10 and L3 segments. We see that they occur more frequently between T12 and L1 segments, accounting for 40 and 45% of the fractures in this segment. The spine must reconcile two imperative contradictory mechanisms. One of them is rigidity and the other is flexibility. With this in mind, we always have to consider the structural and functional aspects of treating this type of patients. Surgical principles are based on this scheme. When we have a patient with spinal injury, the first question we must ask ourselves is whether the spine is stable or unstable. If the spine is stable and does not have neurological involvement, which is the second question to ask, management can be non-operative. On the other hand, if it's stable but with as an associated neurological deficit, then we must decide on the surgical management. For all unstable fractures, whether or not they have neuro neurological involvement, we must think of surgical management. The principles that we must take into account every time we elect for spine surgery are the principles of decompression, stabilization, balance, and fusion. This will allow us to obtain a better result. We know that patients who have neurological involvement can be decompressed and well, this can generate some effect in terms of its stability and also improve the functional aspect when the patient has an instability generated by the fracture and we plan to stabilize it with screws. We must at this point consider the structural aspect and not forget it when we're going to place our rods and we want to leave the column as stable as possible. We must always take into consideration that we must leave a balanced spine, otherwise we may have unfavorable long-term results. Therefore, the goals of treatment must be to preserve or recover neurological integrity, reduce displaced lesions, lesions, maintain balance, preserve stability and avoid chronic pain and late deformity. To accomplish this, we must know how to classify thoracolumbar fracture. We know that over the time, spine fracture classifications have undergone a series of changes in which they take into account precisely these functional and structural aspects. No classification is perfect, but they are necessary since they allow us to build diagnostic criteria that can direct treatment in efforts to make the correct therapeutic decisions. We must also always consider the age of the patients, the comorbidities this patient may have, the psychological state, the balance of the spine curves, the number of settings that are affected, and any associated lesions in a polytraumatized patient. Do not forget to account 
to the ability of resources in said spine center before performing surgery. The skills of the spine surgeon and experience of the spine center are also very important when we decide to perform spine surgery. One of the classifications that we currently use is the most is the AO classification with the bistorical lumbar fractures in type A, type B, and type C, which has a series of variabilities that definitely give us much clearer idea of what type of management can we opt for and can even determine if we should take an anterior or posterior approach. We can also deduce whether we can manage the patients non operatively which most type A1 fractures can. We must always keep in mind that regardless of the fractures, we must take and general structure evaluations to always leave a balanced spine. Some of the parameters taken into consideration are spinopelvic parameters, such as the pelvic incidence, the pelvic inclination, and the sacral slope. We always take into consideration these values. Every time a patient arrives, it is necessary to obtain pre- and post-op values to be included in the medical records. Again, these values are pelvic incidence, pelvic inclination, and sacral slope, and lumbar lord doses. These values make up what is called spinopelvic harmony, which is the value that allows us to evaluate if we have left a stable spine or a spine that will at some point require revision surgery. The spinopelvic harmony tells us there must be a relationship between pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis no greater than a difference of 10 degrees. If this exists, it is probably necessary to evaluate the general state in which you have left spinal column. In regards of treatment, there are some articles that tell us about the criteria we must take into consideration if opting for conserva conservative management of a patient. This article reports patients who do not have a neurological deficit with less than 50% loss of anterior column height and less than 30% in relation to the reduction of what will be the obliteration of the spinal canal. They also report that most of the time even 20% of these patients may have moderate or severe pain. In our experience, we have realized that patients who have an increase greater than 30 degrees and sometimes even less are likely to have complications known as post-traumatic hyphosis that requires a slightly more invasive treatment such as spine osteotomies to correct balance. We know that we have a long large number of options which must be tailored for each patient. For example, we have short level instrumentations and it also greatly depends on the segment. If the fracture is far from the hinge, for example, we can instrument two segments above and two below the fracture vertebra to give stability. There are some techniques that are used to give a little distraction and try to correct the compression that exists at the central level and try to improve balance. We have some experience in regards to the other types of instrumentation, such as instrumentation of fracture vertebra, which allow us to perform a short instrumentations. This is based on the principle in which we push point is made with the anterior vector, creating an orductic force that corrects the traumatic cyphosis, allowing an increase in the stiffness of the instrumentation in the load. We have some cases in the department performing with these techniques where one of the fundamental points is what type of patient can we treat with this type of surgical technique. In conclusion, for this type of injury, increasing, increasing the rigidity of the instrumentation increases the anterior posterior and transverse angle of the spinal canal, allowing a short instrumentation to be performed with fewer resources, improving and obtaining a greater probability of surgery by anterior approach. What are the indications that must be present? One of them is that we have integrity, at least one pedicle is not fractured, and also maintaining integrity of the posterior elements. One of the things we do use is screws 30 or 25 in length. The first objective is to is placing it where it meets the intersection of the trabecule, which gives the greatest strength to the vertebral body. The other is that the event that we are were to have some sort of complication that require an anterior approach, it is not necessary to perform posterior surgery to remove the screw. 
This is the main indication by which we place this screw. We know we can perform instrumentation either anteriorly or posteriorly using various resources trying to give that stability to the segment and well, we can do it anterior spacers that are really being used more and more because they give stability to an anterior segment and or even with the use of some type of mesh with the graph. We have some spacers with a greater length that allows to correct this hypothesis and prevent the balance from being altered in this segment. We also have options that we came to use at some point before this type of spacers arrived, such as the placement of bone graft, such as the use of ribs, which also gives the important stability it needs. One of the fundamental aspects in the easy evaluation that one must have of both preoperative and postoperative patients. And for this, we must know and apply this type of evaluation because it allows to follow up on the result that we want to obtain from these patients. Using scales that have to do with pain, employment status, and quality of life and, and disability. There are many types of international service we can use and they allow us to draw easier comparisons with the results of other others. Another suggestion. When we perform surgery, we have to do some type of, of evaluation to specifically assess the intrinsic vertebral hypothesis or the W angle that allows to know how much we have produced. It can also tell us if the long term, if the vertebra is not collapsing enough, which tells us about a difficulty of our problem in that will be the fusion. It is necessary to keep in mind the algorithms that are going to give us clear idea of what the management could be. It is necessary to take into account if it's stable or unstable lesion, if it has neurological compromise, the percentage of hyphosis seen it will allow us to determine if we can perform a short instrumentation, a long instrumentation, or if we need to do some type of osteotomy or perform some type of complement at the previous level as we have already commented. In conclusion, the message I want to leave you is that when you see a patient who has thoracolumbar fracture, we must always keep in mind that the concept of stability. Know the classifications and assign the, this fracture a category because it will allow us to identify both its severity and possible prognosis. Do not forget the functional aspect where the fractures generate some type of compression that requires decompression. We must always take into account the type of management and have a surgical plan. Have a plan A, a plan B, and if you can, a plan C. Sometimes fractures are seen in one way on the x-rays, but when we are performing surgery, can be changed a lot. This is because we are talking about imaging studies that are static studies, and when we want to start to operate of them, we see that there is more injuries that can be, cannot be seen on image studies. It is necessary that always have this concept of what clinical diagnostic therapeutic congress is that we are thinking always relates with what we want to do and what we are seeing in the studies and we must always assess what is the condition of the spinal canal any residual hyphosis and loss of body height whatever we consider regards of regardless of the result we know that the final long-term result of the fracture is most important and this is directly associated with the quality of the spinal fusion perform. This will depend di directly on stability, which is the primary objective in spinal instrumentation. Lastly, there are large of number systems and tendings to this decompress and perform a fusion either by via anterior or posterior, one level or two levels of decompression. But what is the best manage? What is the best, op the best option? All this must be based on what we know as evidence-based medicine. That's what I want to share. I'm very happy to be with you. you. I will see you soon. I hope this will be useful. Thank you very much.